Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the first workshop session of our Centenary Summit. It's good to have you all here. My name is John McLennan. I'm the chairman of uh, Red Cross in New South Wales. I'm also the chairman of the Migration Programs Advisory Committee, and one of the programs that uh, that committee oversees is the Immigration uh, Detention Monitoring Program. As you know, Australian Red Cross has many programs across our seven strategic priority areas, some such as tracing, uh, have been operating for almost 100 years and some are relatively new, responding to the changing nature of vulnerability in the community. Thank you, Len, for closing the door. Appreciate that. Uh, there are some programs that we consider to be core priorities and which we fully fund from our own resources to maintain our independence and our neutrality. Uh, detention monitoring is one of those programs. In recent years, I've uh, been lucky enough to observe with keen interest the challenging but very important work uh, that Vicky Moore, seated over there, and uh, her detention monitoring team uh, have been doing. Um, I've had the relatively rare privilege, personal privilege, of visiting immigration detention centres in Darwin, Perth, Melbourne, and also the offshore facility in Nauru. Those experiences have confirmed my belief that our monitoring of immigration detention facilities in Australia and offshore is vital to ensuring the health, <coughs> dignity and well-being of people in detention. Today we brought together some of the key people involved in responding to the current immigration detention environment in Australia and as a result of recent government policy changes on Nauru and on Manus Island. I'll introduce our expert panel in just a minute, but first I want to talk about why this work is, at its heart, an obligation of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement and a, a privilege for the movement to undertake and why the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Australian Red Cross have such a particular and important role in immigration detention. The most common nationalities currently in immigration detention are Iranians, Sri Lankans, both Tamil and Sinhalese, Iraqis, Palestinians and people from Afghanistan. They've come from countries beset by war and or persecution. Some of them have previously even volunteered for uh, their National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in tasks such as delivering aid and medical supplies. Some of them are former prisoners who were visited by the ICRC during their time in detention in their home countries. They may have been political prisoners or a member of a minority or perhaps detained after being captured during an armed conflict. By the time they reach Australia and are placed into immigration detention, they're often very vulnerable as a result of the armed conflict, torture, separation from their family and the sometimes extremely difficult journey to get to Australia in the first place. When they see, whilst they're in immigration detention, an Australian Red Cross person who is monitoring the conditions in the detention centre, advocating on their behalf and seeking to re reconnect them with their families, um, it's a small but a very significant sign of safety and security and a genuine reassurance that someone really is looking out for their interests. When they see the Red Cross emblem worn by our detention monitors, and I should say that Red Cross uh, monitors are sometimes the only people that they see other than the service providers uh, retained by the government to run the facilities, they then know that they're not alone, that they're not forgotten, that the Red Cross will advocate for their humane treatment and for improved conditions in the detention facilities. Our staff and volunteers visit the detention centres regularly. They hear the detainees' stories. They inspect the facilities, they talk with the authorities, and all of this is in an attempt to ensure that the most vulnerable do have a voice. And because the emblem is known, and more importantly because the emblem is trusted, people feel comfortable talking to the Red Cross, knowing that the discussion will be in confidence. They trust us, and I strongly believe that we should not let them down. Detention monitoring is a long-standing core function for the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, and our current role in monitoring the Australian immigration detention system is, I believe, an important example of that international role. Now, I'm sure that you're as interested as I am to hear the different experiences and perspectives of uh, our expert panel. Uh, it's intended, just by way of housekeeping, that each will speak for about 10 minutes, um, after which, uh, if we stick to our 10 minutes, we'll see how we go, um, there should probably be about half an hour left at the end of the uh, session uh, for questions from the floor. So if you have a question, I'd encourage you to make a note of it, mentally or otherwise, um, and ask it when we get to the Q&A session at the end. Um, that'll help not to interrupt the flow of the presentations of each of our speakers. Um, 
Uh, you'll note that although this isn't a big room, I am using a microphone and our speakers have also been asked to use microphones. Um, that's because the presentation or the workshop is being recorded and we're told by the AV people that if you don't speak into the microphone, it won't get onto the tape. So uh, even when you're asking questions, there will be a roving microphone. So if you could, when you're called upon, just wait for the microphone to get to you. So now let me introduce our expert panel to you in the order, I think, in which they will speak. Um, I think the order in which they're sitting as well, which is very convenient. Um, starting first is uh, Fred Grimm. Uh, Fred is the head of the ICRC regional delegation for the Pacific, uh, and he's based in Suva in Fiji. Uh, Fred had worked uh, some years ago now as an editor at Berner Zeitung in Bern, um, Switzerland, for uh, four years, and then joined the ICRC in 1986, which is a while ago now, isn't it, Fred? A long a while ago. Um, Fred has more than 20 years of international humanitarian operational and leadership experience working in management positions in Angola, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kenya, Thailand and at headquarters in Geneva. That's quite a, uh, a list of countries, Fred, I must say. Very impressive. Um, Fred was the deputy head of the delegation in Bangkok monitoring operational activities in southern Thailand, Cambodia and Laos before taking up his current post in October this year. Uh, Fred is a Swiss citizen and studied contemporary history at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Welcome uh, to Australia, Fred. It's good to have you here. Um, Vicky Moore, must be well known to many of you, I think. Yes, surely. Um, manages the Immigration Detention Monitoring Program at Australian Red Cross, which involves regular humanitarian observer visits to all Australian immigration detention facilities um, and undertaking associated humanitarian diplomacy on individual and systemic issues at a site and national level. Prior to this, Vicky spent the last 20 years in a range of roles with Australian and international agencies, working mainly with refugee communities across Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Gaza and the West Bank, as well as managing technical expertise programs in sub-Saharan Africa, working in cross-cultural education and advocacy in Australia, and undertaking postgraduate study in the Middle East and Australia, researching human rights frameworks in the Arab and Muslim world. Welcome, Vicky. Uh, Megan Goodwin, welcome, Megan. Um, commenced, uh, is a national program coordinator for tracing. Uh, Megan commenced her relationship with Australian Red Cross as an IHL, ASAS and tracing volunteer and a member of the Youth Advisory Committee in Victoria in 1997. Megan began work as a tracing caseworker in the Kosovo and East Timorese safe havens in 1999. Megan has since worked in the immigration detention program visiting onshore and offshore detention facilities, as well as coordinating the national immigration detention and community detention programs. She's also worked internationally as an ICRC RFL, Restoring Family Links delegate in Indonesia and also East Timor. She is currently the acting national program coordinator for the International Tracing Service. And finally, Andrea Lux. Get the pronunciation correct? Thank you. Very tricky. Uh, Andrea has been a volunteer humanitarian observer with Australian Red Cross since the beginning of 2013, visiting Christmas Island, Nauru and Curtin. Prior to volunteering with Australian Red Cross, she was an intern in both the refugee casework team at Amnesty International and the legal protection unit of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and she has previously volunteered as a migration agent with the Refugee and Immigration Legal Centre. And Andrea joins us from Darwin, where she is based. So welcome to all of you. Um, I think now my role is almost over for the moment, so I'd like to hand over now to Fred to present to us today. Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you, uh, John, um, dear friends and colleagues from the uh, uh, Red Cross. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great honor for me to be present uh, in this uh, panel discussion on the auspicious occasion of the Century Summit uh, of the Australian Red Cross. And I am very pleased that I get the occasion to present uh, the uh, uh, shortly the uh, general ICRC detention activities and to talk about this uh, unique partnership. In fact, we have uh, developed uh, 
with the Australian Red Cross for their visits in the regional processing centers in uh, Nauru and Manus over the last two years. So thank you very much for inviting me. I hope I can manage with this. Yeah. <laughs> Just have to see how it looks on the screen. Yeah, okay, it's uh, detectable. So, <coughs> well, first I would like to give you a kind of a broad uh, overview on, uh, on the scope of ICRC's uh, detention activities. Uh, you see that we are uh, visiting basically uh, detention places pretty much uh, all over the world. And we are visiting um, uh, detainees in different uh, kinds of situations. Uh, we are visiting uh, prisoners of war. Uh, as an example, I can give uh, Djibouti at the Horn of Africa. That's uh, from a very forgotten international conflict, in fact, which lasted only a few days in 2008 between Djibouti and Eritrea, but there are still some uh, POWs uh, present. There are others uh, still in Afghanistan. Uh, there are um, uh, detainees in situation of a non-international armed conflict, for example, in uh, Syria. Uh, but we are also increasingly uh, uh, visiting uh, migrants, uh, for example, in Malaysia. But as I said before, uh, now also in uh, Manus and in, uh, in Nauru. So all in all, we are visiting in about uh, 90 countries all over the world in uh, 1,730 uh, places of detention, all in all 750,000 detainees. These are the figures for uh, last year, 2013. And among these 750,000, uh, we are visiting 23,000 detainees individually, so not globally. Uh, in the prisons we are visiting with uh, uh, 23,000 uh, individually. So why, in fact, why is ICRC visiting detainees? Uh, these visits, it's a core, it's a core activity of ICRC for not only many, many years, but many decades. It started with uh, uh, visits to prisoners of war during the First World War, Second World War. Um, basically, the main reason is that uh, we visit uh, these persons because uh, people in detention, they retain their fundamental humanity and their basic health, dignity, and well-being must be respected. So that's the overall overarching objective of uh, the detention visits. So basically the ICRC visits to monitor the conditions of detention, including health care, shelter, food, water, hygiene. To monitor the treatment and relations between detainees and authorities so that they are uh, treated according to uh, established international uh, standards. Uh, ensure that family contacts can happen and uh, uh, prisoners are able to exchange news with their, with their families. And through monitoring and dialogue with the authorities through a confidential dialogue of what we see uh, during our visits, uh, we transmit these information uh, to the authorities. Through this confidential dialogue, we want to uh, assure that uh, no ill treatment, no torture uh, is happening in these uh, places of detention. And also, we want to support the authorities to fulfill their responsibilities to, to, to solve problems in the places of detention. So we make recommendations uh, after our visits, after our uh, talks with the detainees, we make recommendations. And the authorities, uh, at the in the first place, they have the responsibility to make sure that the places of detention are managed according to uh, basic uh, standards. So it's uh, up to the authorities to ensure that, but in certain instances, the ICRC contributes with uh, direct assistance in the places of detention. Oops. 
So now, uh, briefly, I would like to uh, tell you who we visit. I have already talked a little bit about this and how uh, we are carrying out uh, these uh, detention visits. So we visit people detained in relation to international armed conflicts, the prisoners of war. So as I said, started in World War I, World War II. Uh, we visit uh, persons arrested in relation to non-international armed conflicts, other situations of violence, which can be uh, uh, people arrested due to political tension, uh, political conflict, political detainees. And we visit also um, persons uh, arrested uh, in other contexts, like uh, persons arrested, uh, migrants uh, arrested, migrants. So over time, uh, uh, the conflict, uh, conflict situation, the conflict, uh, the nature of uh, conflicts have changed, the nature of reasons for detention have changed, and the ICRC has adapted to this changed environment. And the mandate uh, for ICRC to visit prisoners of war has been expanded through uh, decisions by the International Conference and uh, in the statutes of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, there is, also, uh, uh, there is also a right of initiative enshrined now, so that the ICRC can take the initiative and can offer its services to authorities to visit um, uh, places of detention, to visit uh, detainees. So that is important to see, I mean, uh, the reasons to visit uh, detainees has changed uh, over the last 70, 80 years. I mean, there have been a lot of changes. 70, 80 years ago, there were probably no or not much migrants being detained. Today, this has become, in many places of the globe, uh, a main issue. And as you uh, best know, especially also in Australia and uh, the Pacific, So this shows a bit this, uh, this change of uh, approach or this adaptation of the ICRC uh, approach. Uh, <coughs> we have basically changed from a category-based approach, so visiting specific categories of detainees, POWs, security detainees, political detainees, uh, to an uh, all-detainee approach. So, uh, or detainees, uh, uh, yeah, all detainee approach. Uh, and why, why is this? Uh, we have realized that obviously when we go to a place of detention, when we visit uh, specific categories of detainees, uh, there are much more detainees in these uh, places of detention. They all have basically, they are all facing the same problems and we need to, to uh, adapt, we need to, uh, to, uh, to enlarge our uh, assistance, also the protection to all uh, those uh, present in a, in a place of detention. So I think this is a important, uh, an important point. We have moved from a, a, a category-based approach to an all-detainee uh, approach. So despite all these, uh, these changes uh, 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 from uh, uh, in our uh, visiting, uh, visiting approach, we have maintained uh, the same established uh, visiting methods. Because we believe that with these, uh, with these modus of uh, visits, we can best uh, guarantee to address uh, protection and assistance needs of uh, of uh, those people we visit. So we if, if we do a visit, we want to have access to all detainees and all places where uh, detainees uh, um, are, are held. Uh, before every visit in a place of detention, uh, we have a confidential uh, uh, initial talk, discussion with the authorities of the place. We carry out a tour of the premises 
So the cells, the, the, the sanitary blocks, the kitchen, we want to make, we want to know uh, what kind of diet the, the detainees uh, receive. We want to have a global picture of a place of detention. And to, 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 um, to have really a, a, a full, full picture, we need to talk to the detainees themselves because, I mean, we go there on a specific day, then maybe uh, we will not come back for a, a few months. So we need to know from those who are in the place of detention how life in detention is. So we want to have private talks with these detainees. Private talks means uh, talks without the presence of authorities so that the detainees can uh, tell us uh, what they live in the place of detention without uh, uh, the authorities, those who detain them, listening to it. So this is extremely important. And then, uh, after each visit, we have a final confidential discussion with the authorities. We talk about uh, what we have seen uh, during these visits, and later on we, uh, we, uh, we, um, we make reports and we hand over these reports to the concerned authorities. We ask for meetings to discuss these reports, to discuss the findings, and to discuss the recommendations the ICRC made uh, uh, after each, uh, each visit. So, what I would like to insist uh, with regard to our uh, modalities of visits, it is the confidential approach, because we believe that with this confidential approach, this gives us the best, uh, the best uh, possibilities, the best chan chances that we can change and improve the conditions uh, of detention uh, of the detainees uh, if needed, in case of need. So this confidentiality that we work in a confidential dialogue with the authorities that is uh, a central, a central uh, point uh, for, our, for our detention work. So now I would like uh, to talk about, uh, well, a, bit, a little bit the uh, main subject, obviously, it is this unique uh, partnership with the uh, Australian Red Cross with regard to the visits in uh, Manus and in, uh, in, uh, in Nauru. So traditionally, the ICRC never carries out visits with, uh, with, uh, with other actors, uh, with other organizations. We do cooperate with uh, certain uh, uh, actors, state actors, ministries of justice, ministries of health, because they have the, 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 they have the obligation to, to uh, make sure that conditions of, uh, of detention are, uh, are according to standards in the places of detention. But carrying out the visits, this the ICRC so far has always done uh, on its own. And uh, why is this so? It is basically, uh, as I said before, to, uh, because of the confidentiality of, the, of this work. The ICRC has certain privileges and immunities agreed with the, agree with the governments with whom it works. Uh, and that safeguards this uh, confidentiality, this confidentiality of the detention work. For example, bilateral reports cannot be shared with anyone else uh, without ICRC permission. ICRC delegates cannot be called on to testify in courts concerning what they observe or discuss in places of detentions. And its reports uh, and its working papers, uh, they cannot be seized. So there is a, there is a strong reason for also uh, with regard to the confidentiality that it protects, it protects uh, our work. So, why then, uh, why then we, have, uh, we have agreed with this, uh, to enter in this partnership with the Australian Red Cross? Uh, I would say it is to enhance the effectiveness and quality of, uh, of, the, uh, of the action of the visits. As you probably know, the uh, Australian Red Cross works in 
uh, migration detention centers for more than two decades, I think. So you have a very strong knowledge of uh, this migration uh, issue in Australia. You have an excellent uh, knowledge of the of the well political environment uh, in which this uh, migration detention is taking place. Uh, so basically, the AR ARC has a lot of uh, of expertise and has carried out these visits uh, according to similar uh, mode of action as ICRC is, uh, is carrying out its, uh, its visits. So there are shared principles, shared objectives, and there is also this agreement on the confidential approach. So, well, it's also uh, an innovation, as I said. I mean, it's really it's the only context in the world where ICRC carries out the detention monitoring jointly with another actor. And uh, this is happening for the last two years. And uh, we, the ICRC, highly values this, uh, this partnership. I think it's an excellent example on how we can capitalize on the strengths and experience of, uh, of each other in a very important uh, humanitarian field. So probably I'm already a little bit too long, but uh, huh, John, you stop me. I won't stop you, but if you've come to the end of your uh, presentation. I'm yeah, so just um, a few figures on these uh, visits to the regional processing centers and what we do and what we don't do. So Nauru, that is uh, in the picture, this uh, rather tiny island of Nauru, which is, I think, 21 square kilometers, that makes uh, four on five kilometers, has about 9,000 uh, people as population, plus then 1,140 migrants. And uh, that certainly also is already indicates a bit of the kind of problems that uh, can, uh, can generate. So far there were seven joint ICRC ARC visits so in the last two years. There are 30 protection re registrations, so 30 uh, detainees we are individually following because we believe they have specific problems which need a specific follow-up, so they are registered. And then we have also 31 uh, tracing cases. And then Manos Island, uh, there we started in October 2014. There is a migration population of 1,050. Five ICRC visits with uh, uh, ARC support and there are 20 protection uh, cases and 20 active tracing cases. So uh, that's what I wanted to say to, uh, at the beginning. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, really, I think it is a, an excellent uh, partnership. It's a, an excellent pilot case of partnership uh, between uh, ARC and the I I ICRC in this, after all, very sensitive and very complex uh, issue of migration detention. Thanks, Fred. Please join me in thanking Fred Grimm for his presentation. <laughs> and now we have Vicky Moore, who will give us the Australian perspective. Thank you, Vicky. Testing, still working? It's dangerous to give me a microphone. Um, I might go on for a while. Um, I'm not sure what more there is to say. Thanks, John, for your lovely introduction. And thanks, Fred, for a really comprehensive overview of not only how the ICRC works, but I think how we work as well. I feel like sitting down and passing over to Megan. But I'll, I'll, um, I'll persist, and I'll give you a bit of an overview of the context here in Australia in particular. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that in the crowd today, uh, we've got quite a few staff and quite a few of our volunteers. So thank you for coming along. And I'm kind of here to represent what we're doing, but thanks for, for coming today, as well as the colleagues who have come here as well. Um, for those of you who've, uh, who have heard this before, I apologize. Um, hopefully, for some of you, this will be new information or more information than maybe you've received in the past. Some of you from Australian Red Cross will be aware we don't do a lot of public speaking about what we do. So this is quite a good opportunity to share some of that information with you. 
As you can see, we also don't have many images of us in immigration detention, so we do borrow the ICRC images sometimes. <laughs> Is that better? Yep. Okay. Now I'll really get going. Um, uh, so I'll cover a bit of the context. I'll cover a bit of, of exactly how our team works specific to the Australian environment. Um, but I will leave, we've got Andrea, one of our volunteers here today, to talk a bit more specifically about what we actually do in immigration detention. But I'll do a bit of an over overview for you. Um, so many of you would be aware, obviously, in immigration detention in Australia is quite a political issue at the moment, which for me certainly highlights the need of Australian Red Cross to approach this issue from our impartial and neutral viewpoint. And um, the monitoring that we do of immigration detention is a really good way, I think, of demonstrating how some of those principles are integrated into our daily work here in Australia. And I think Andrea will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but in terms of the context, so we've had mandatory detention in Australia since 1992. Um, people who are detained in immigration detention centres in Australia include, we all know, people who have arrived by boat. Um, the government refers to those as um, illegal maritime arrivals or irregular maritime arrivals. It also includes uh, crew. As, and it also includes people um, who have contravened their visas. Um, so irregular air arrivals, people who have arrived by plane without the appropriate visa, people who have breached their visa or overstayed their visa, uh, foreign fishers. Um, there are people in detention who have had their, their visas cancelled because they present unacceptable risks to the community. Um, and there are also people who are subject to adverse security assessments from ASIO. So it's quite a diverse population in detention. Over the last 20 years, we've seen that detention really change quite a lot. So kind of this time last year, if you'd spoken to me or anyone in my team, we would have all looked pretty exhausted. We had very high numbers in detention at that point. At one stage, it got up to approximately 10,000 people in detention um, with the amount of people who were arriving by boat. Um, at the moment, as you can see, the latest statistics from the Department of Immigration uh, that there are 5,235 people in Australian and Australian-funded offshore facilities. So I include all of the numbers in here because obviously our team is now um, addressing needs both on and offshore, um, but that includes over just over 3,000 people in the Australian detention network. 726 children currently in detention, um, and that includes about 560 here in Australia, and many of you would be familiar with um, inquiries that are going on at the moment, specifically the one run by the Australian Human Rights Commission into the issue of children in detention. It's certainly, again, I guess, reflecting on, on the last couple of years, one of the challenges we had was um, the very widely acknowledged increase in families and children arriving to Australia by boat, which presented a lot of challenges for our program because it was a large group that we hadn't encountered at such um, level in the past. Another issue that's very important to the Immigration Detention Program and Australian Red Cross is the average length of detention. So as you can see at the moment um, in Australia that's on the increase, it's currently at 426 days. So if you just take a moment to stop about that, that's th to stop and think about that, that's over a year in immigration detention um, for the majority of the population. I think about and one of my staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, about seven, at least 70% of people in immigration detention have been there for over a year. So that's the average figure that the Department of Immigration has recently released. And that's a really long time to spend in a closed detention facility. Um, as I've put there on the bottom, another relevant part for the program is people who are held in remote centres. So by remote, we mean a long way away from any kind of metropolitan support, resources, visitors, ability to undertake excursions. And that includes, at the moment, people on Christmas Island in Nauru and in Manus Island in PNG. Let me coordinate microphones, papers. Here we go. This is a slightly outdated map, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a idea of Australian immigration detention facilities. So as a team, we're not a huge team. We've got um, about 10 staff in our team and we've got about 30 volunteers. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But this is from last year. A few of these centres have been closed. But you can see Christmas Island up in the corner. That's about three and a half, four hours flight from Perth, from memory, all the way down to Pontville down here, which was actually closed um, last year. So it's a huge breadth. Um, across Australia of immigration detention facilities. I did, couldn't quite fit Nauru and Manus on the map, so Fred, thank you for your map earlier. Um, but it just gives you some idea of, we live in a really big country and those immigration detention facilities are well spread throughout. 
One of the positive things we've seen happen over the last six to 12 months is that um, because there are less people arriving by boat to the Australian mainland, there's been a drop in detention population in particular, which has enabled the closure of a number of facilities. So you'll see that there's a number of metropolitan facilities. The ones that have been closed are the, a lot of the remote ones. So Sherga up there has been closed, Curtin has been closed, Leonora has been closed, Port Augusta has been closed. So one of the positive developments we've seen is that the centres that are closed are the ones that are most remote. Um, but we still have 16 immigration detention facilities that we monitor on a regular basis, um, both in Australia and offshore. Uh, this time last year we had 23, so it's a relief to the team. We don't quite have as many to work on at the moment. Monitoring immigration detention in Australia. So I got my question slightly in the wrong order, but I'll go through the order of the PowerPoint anyway. So first I'll talk about what we do. So very briefly, we monitor. So as Fred was talking about earlier, when we monitor, we inspect, we talk to groups, we talk to individuals, we spend time in detention centres. So when we go somewhere like Christmas Island, for example, we might spend 10 days on Christmas Island visiting those detention centres. Some of that will be spent having meetings with the authorities and some of that will be spent sitting down with people, sitting down with groups of people in detention um, or individuals depending on how people want to engage with us. Um, we then identify, so we identify issues of humanitarian concern, we collect evidence, we triangulate the kind of information we're receiving. And then after that we advocate. And Australian Red Cross, I know ICRC doesn't necessarily use the term advocate, but Australian Red Cross interprets that as meaning we undertake humanitarian diplomacy. So that is negotiation, persuasion and engagement with the authorities about changes that are needed within immigration detention to address the vulnerabilities of people that are held. Why do we do it? And this should have been my first question. Um, we do it because there's a need. There's a clear humanitarian need, as, as um, Fred was discussing um, a moment ago. We do it because there's a gap, because we're the only organisation that goes regularly into detention and actually speaks to people regarding their humanitarian issues every quarter, not once or twice a year, but every quarter, sometimes more than once a quarter. Um, we have the expertise, so we have the expertise as a movement, we have the expertise from the ICRC and we base ourselves very much on ICRC working modalities. We also have the expertise from the Federation that gives us guidance in how we approach migrants and migrant communities and humanitarian diplomacy. Um, we also have the commitment, which I think is, is very important from Australian Red Cross. So those of you who um, would be well across our board policy statements, um, especially on migration, states that Red Cross assists people who are made vulnerable through the process of migration and whose survival, dignity, physical or mental health is under threat, irrespective of their legal status. That's a very important last point. That um, consistent with the principle of impartiality, we don't judge who gets to receive our assistance, we seek to assist the most vulnerable and in detention most of those people um, have difficulties with their legal status here in Australia which is why they're detained. We also visit um, because we have a role as auxiliary to the public authorities in the humanitarian field. You'd all be aware with that responsibility on national societies to work with the authorities where there is a need for us to provide feedback, which is very much what we do in immigration detention, again, um, in a similar way to what Fred described earlier. Um, how do we do it? So I talked a little bit about this when I was um, talking about what we do, but in the monitoring we have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Immigration. We've had that memorandum of understanding since 2009 and we've had formal agreements since about 2003 um, as a program and prior to that, since the early uh, 90s, we were working on more informal arrangements to monitor detention. So our MOU gives us full access to every immigration detention facility in Australia. We're able to go in and speak to who we want, when we want, which is very important. And obviously security considerations um, feed into that as well. The MOU ensures that access, but it also really importantly ensures a way of escalating issues of humanitarian concern that we identify, and that's very important. I'll talk about that um, in a bit. We do regular visits, like I said, the Immigration Detention Monitoring Program visits every centre in Australia and Christmas Island every quarter, at, the, at least, sometimes more. Um, so we don't just go in once or twice, we go back and often it's our staff and our volunteers who are going back and actually speaking at the moment to the same people in detention that they spoke to last month and the month before that, which is a challenge in itself as a program. Um, 
we put together expert teams. Um, so we've got staff who all have varying kind of um, fields of expertise um, within the team, but we also utilise a group of about 30 volunteers that also have um, complementary expertise that we can pull in to, to relevant visits. So an example of that would be that, say, there's a particularly large group of children that have been taken into a particular immigration detention facility. We can find the right volunteer and staff team to actually address those particular vulnerabilities within that centre. Um, we do a lot of work collecting evidence, so we don't go in and talk to one person and say, okay, we've got our issues and that's it. We go in and we talk to groups, we talk to individuals, we talk to the authorities, we talk to detention service providers as well who are engaged by the authorities to run services in detention. Um, and as part of that, that comes together as a body of evidence that then allows us to prioritise what issues we might be most concerned about in the centre. Um, and often we assess and prioritise those against set standards that we have of what we refer to as humanitarian um, standards for monitoring immigration detention and they're a, a bit of a benchmark, a minimum standard for what we would expect to see in immigration detention. The advocacy part of it, um, so like I said earlier, we rely quite heavily on humanitarian diplomacy. So just to talk a little bit about that, because sometimes that's the area that's not as well understood of the program, is that in the very first instance, we undertake encouragement of self-advocacy at a site level. So when we speak to people who are held in detention, we talk to them about what they can do to help themselves. We're not a permanent presence in detention. We're not there able to raise cases on a daily basis. So part of the very initial work of our teams is to talk to people about the mechanisms that exist within detention for them to advocate for themselves. Secondly, we undertake site level advocacy. Um, so that involves talking with detention centre managers at a site level. It has, we have the entry meetings, we have the exit meetings, um, and we engage with them on a regular basis to talk to them about what we're concerned about. That's always followed up with written records of exactly what our concerns are and an expectation that they'll be followed up on um, by the centre managers. Things that aren't resolved at a site level then get escalated often to a national level where we submit kind of quarterly reports around our specific thematic issues of concern across the whole network. And you'll remember that map that I showed you earlier with the breadth of those immigration detention centres. Um, that also gives us a real ability to kind of walk in and see what might be working in one centre isn't working in another, but we can let them know about practice that exists elsewhere within the immigration detention network where they may have been able to do it better. Um, so that's one of the roles that we undertake as well. We can also escalate things to research. I think we've got a couple of volunteers here in the room who have been part of that research. So if there's a particular issue of humanitarian concern, we may seek to do more investigation into it and do a separate report. Um, I should say that Red Cross, Australian Red Cross in particular, always reserves the right to go public if our concerns aren't addressed. And it is a constant issue of debate internally within Australian Red Cross about making sure that what we're doing is most effective and the way in which we're going about it is the best way to do it. Um, and those debates are ongoing in terms of making sure that both our site level advocacy the national advocacy and then the senior um, meetings with the minister or with the heads of department are as effective as they can be to institute change for people who are vulnerable in immigration detention. I think that's probably all I need to say at this point. We might leave um, anything else for discussions. I've just we can talk about that a little in the, in the questions if anyone's interested, but I think a lot of what the immigration detention program finds itself doing is looking at mitigating the impacts of detention. And as a result of that, we've developed a number of principles that guide the program about, in an ideal world, this is the way that we would see um, appropriate um, conditions in immigration detention. So you'll see mention to the timely assessment of protection claims, access to oversight agencies and legal advice, health and welfare services, um, uh, community standards being one of the guiding ways of evaluating um, appropriate services in detention, the restoration of family links, um, and then obviously up the top there that all people in immigration detention should be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of the reason for or the location of their detention. I don't really need to say much about offshore, I don't think, Fred, because you summed it up very well, but I will say, from our point of view, the partnership that has developed with ICRC has been an incredibly strong and rewarding one, so I think we've all learnt a lot from the partnership and certainly the teams that go out to monitor immigration detention um, on Nauru and Manus are working together really effectively and I think the bottom line with that is that 
the movement has found a way to respond to the vulnerabilities of people in detention in the best possible way. As, as we heard yesterday, um, often people don't recognise the difference between Australian Red Cross and ICRC or Federation when we're in somewhere like an immigration detention centre. What they see is that Red Cross has done what they can to respond to the vulnerabilities in the way in which we work. So I think for me that's the real takeaway, that, that the movement has responded the way the movement should, which is to consider first and foremost what can be done in immigration detention and how we can best do it. So for me that's the real takeaway of this um, and hopefully it's a bit of a model for, for ICRC and for other national societies and federation in terms of a model of working together um, and addressing those humanitarian needs. Thank you all. Thanks Vicky. <laughs> Both Fred and Vicky referred to restoring family links in their um, presentations and so it's timely now that uh, Megan Goodwin talked to us about that particular aspect of our work. Megan? I'll click through... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I skipped through. Okay, I was too quick, yes. Um, Hi everyone, thanks for coming along to this session. I guess at the outset I just wanted to stress that um, so there are tracing workers who go into immigration detention facilities to provide tracing services specifically and there are humanitarian observers who do the monitoring activities but we're one Red Cross and we work together, we try and coordinate our visits as much as possible and we definitely work together as a team and the same goes with ICRC with the offshore visits as well. ICRC obviously are the coordinators of tracing across across the um, global network, so that's a very important um, influence in our service provision as well. So I guess I just wanted, wanted to start by um, saying, so our tracing service, which is also referred to as restoring family links, so you probably hear those things being used interchangeably and can be a bit confusing, so tracing, RFL are, are, are used interchangeably, but uh, the service, the tracing serv international tracing service was established 100 years ago during World War I. So it's as old as Australian Red Cross itself. It's a very well established service um, in Australia and, and worldwide. And the objective of this humanitarian service is to restore contact between family members who've been separated by war, conflict, disaster and migration and to clarify the fate of missing persons. So when the tracing service was established um, a century ago, it was based on the belief that delivering news about the, whereaba about the whereabouts or fate of missing family um, during times of war, migration, this is a vital, a really vital humanitarian activity. And even though the face of conflict, the face of migration, technology, communications, they've changed so much over the past 100 years, but that notion of the importance of family links is something that has remained very vital and very relevant today. Um, sorry, I'm not ready to flick through actually. Um, so why is this so relevant in the Australian immigration detention context? So just to, to look back historically, um, when Cambodian asylum seekers started ar arriving in Australia by boat, uh, in 1992 and at that time the Australian government introduced a mandatory um, immigration detention policy. At that time Australian Red Cross recognised um, the vulnerability of people in immigration detention being detained in, in these facilities and sort of started cons considering at that high leadership level in Red Cross um, what humanitarian uh, action could we take to, uh, to assist people in this situation. So it was the tracing service that gave the Australian Red Cross um, a really important tool to be able to negotiate access to all immigration detention facilities and this was a way that we could um, start to reach out to this vulnerable population. So when Red Cross tracing workers, workers first visited the Port Hedland uh, immigration detention facility, um, which is a very remote facility in Western Australia, um, so in 1992 we registered detainees for tracing purposes uh, and offered tracing services to detainees. Um, but as a consequence of having this access to facilities and to detainees, 
uh, Australian Red Cross was able to um, privately advocate with the government um, in relation to detainee concerns about conditions, welfare needs that came up um, sort of as a part of our delivery of tracing services and I guess this all eventually evolved and led to the, to the monitoring um, that we have today. Um, and so why is it so important to offer tracing services? It's in detention. Um, I think as John said, uh, people in Australian immigration detention often come from uh, countries um, where there's been civil, where there's been conflict. Um, so it can be factors such as conflict, persecution, um, that lead people to to go on that migration journey um, that creates this significant global movement of people. Um, and due to this, people's journeys may have resulted in their separation from family and loss of contact with family members. Um, and not knowing the fate of uh, or the whereabouts of family members can really compound the trauma of, of people's uh, migration experience. Um, so by offering tracing services in detention um, and advocating around, privately advocating around ensuring that people are, are able to advise family that they're safe and well um, when they've arrived in Australian immigration detention. By doing this, we're seeking to alleviate some of this, this suffering that people are facing. So I just wanted to share with you uh, an example of the important role that that tracing can play in assisting families in the immigration detention context and as well as the challenges that it poses as well. Um, the challenges and, and complexities for the tracing service uh, in responding to the impact of migration have been illustrated through the, the number of boat disasters that have, that have occurred um, in Australia's ge geographic region in, in recent years, um, asylum seeker boat disasters. So. In the, the past decade, I, I would say that the number of tracing cases that Australian Red Cross has handled relating to migrants, asylum seekers believed to be missing en route to Australia, um, it's significantly increased. It's become uh, a much larger part of our, of our caseload. Uh, and just to give you an example, um, the Keneva uh, asylum seeker boat disaster, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, aware of that occurred in June 2012 off the coast of Christmas Island. Um, there were 110 survivors pulled from the sea. There were 17 um, deceased persons located in the sea and uh, we believe around 85 people um, missing, missing at sea. So in response to this disaster, and, and I guess b b before I say this, the, uh, tracing workers and monitoring workers were already visiting the Christmas Island um, detention facility, so we had those regular visits taking place. But in response to this disaster, we were, we were, we were able to um, quickly deploy two tracing officers um, to, the, to Christmas Island um, within a week of the disaster, and we could do that, that because of um, the role that we'd had um, on Christmas Island. And we were able to conduct uh, interviews with survivors and who were detained in the Christmas Island facility. And we did that so that we could assess whether their families had been notified that they were safe and well. We could also seek information um, from survivors about other people uh, who they had travelled on the boat with. And that was to assist us to respond to inquiries that we were receiving from family overseas. Um, about their missing family. So a lot of the um, asylum seekers who were travelling on the boat were from Pakistan. A large number were from a particular region in Pakistan. There were fr some from Afghanistan as well. So we had, w within a short time of this disaster, received a list of missing persons from the ICRC in Islamabad <coughs> who had been um, meeting with families in Pakistan. Um, so... and. There were photos of, of missing persons sent with those tracing requests to us, so we were able to show photos of missing people to survivors um, and they could provide any first-hand inf first information they had um, to the Red Cross. Um, 
obviously this wasn't official information, but um, in some cases it was the only information that those families would ever receive about their family members, given there's 85 um, who are missing at sea with no evidence, no body, so families have nothing um, to know what the fate of their missing family was, so that information was really important. Um, and we, we received also a high number of phone calls from people within the Australian community who had family that they believed were on the boat. Um, so we were dealing with um, inquirers in Australia and overseas as well, just to, to show you how the, the tracing network um, does, does work and link around the world. So we were able to quite quickly resolve a few inquiries where we located missing persons amongst um, the survivors, which was great. Um, and, and yeah, just to reiterate what I said, that witness accounts um, from survivors about missing persons who were seen on board the vessel um, really was, um, in a lot of cases, the only information that some family members would ever receive. So. We're two years on, over two years on from this disaster now and we still have some cases rela relating to this boat disaster open with us and we've recently um, worked very closely um, with the authorities, with police here in Australia, with the Australian Federal Police who have been responsible for the, um, trying to ident identify th the deceased persons. We work closely with ICRC Islamabad and the Pakistani um, Red Crescent to... They have been supporting families in Pakistan to provide um, blood samples, um, so DNA that can be then matched with the DNA that be has been taken from the uh, unidentified deceased persons that were recovered. Um, so that it just shows you that in relation to tracing, it's often never a very quick response. Um, these types of cases can go on for, for a very long time and, and um, yeah, eventually be about uh, missing people who there will be never any information about. I guess this example also illustrates um, the two aspects of our tracing work in immigration detention. Uh, firstly, that we go into detention to take inquiries from immigration detainees who, who are seeking to restore or main maintain contact with family overseas. Um, but we're also searching the immigration detainee population um, for missing people uh, who we receive inquiries about from overseas, ICRC or national societies. Um, so it's a twofold role that we have. Um, and some of the challenges around looking for sort people in immigration detention uh, is like the way names are registered. So obviously language differences affects the way that the people might be registered by the authorities and names are hard to find. Um, people are on the move um, between detention facilities um, and sometimes we'll receive inquiries where it's often unclear whether someone actually ever made it to Australia, even if that was their intention. So these are some of the challenges for, for tracing in this context. Uh, yeah, so I guess just to, to emphasise that last point that um, we do have this very unique network with ICRC and the 189 national societies around the world and it is having that grassroots um, presence does make it really unique and puts us in this special place to be a position to be able to provide this service, offer this service to people. And lastly, uh, tracing in the Nauru offshore detention facility. Um, so when the Australian government est first established the offshore processing facility in Nauru in 2001, again, as we did in 1992 when mandatory detention was introduced, we were concerned about, Australian Red Cross was concerned about the humanitarian needs of, of these um, detained people and we offered to conduct uh, the tracing assessment. So we did that and based on that assessment, we provided tracing services in the Nauru facility um, from 2002. We had a, a tracing delegate deployed there and then we undertook regular visits. Um, and then of course it was 
the facility wasn't used for some time and, and the, now here it is being used again and again we are um, providing tracing services and working with the monitoring team and ICRC to do that um, in joint visits. Um, and we offered to conduct the tracing assessment in the first instance and initiated this because there's no uh, Red Cross National Society in Nauru, so that's a very important point. Usually Australian Red Cross doesn't go into other territories and um, offers services that's for, for the National Society of that country to do, but Nauru is a, is a unique situation in that there isn't a National Society. Um, so with the permission of the Australian and the Nauruan authorities and based on the Red Cross, Australian Red Cross experience in immigration detention in Australia, um, that was what led us to, to provide the services on Nauru. So I think that's it from me. So I'll hand over to Andrea. Thanks, Megan. Thanks very much. And just by way of introduction to Andrea, I'd, I'd just like to say that um, another one of my interests in Red Cross, uh, in Australian Red Cross, is is the role of volunteers, and it's uh, particularly heartwarming for me that this program um, has a large number of highly professional and well-trained volunteers who uh, who are living the the fundamental principle of voluntary service. So over to you, Andrea. Thank you for that. Um, and on that point, to be honest, I don't have a long history of volunteering. Um, it's something that I came to in my mid-twenties and since then it's played a significant role in my life as my career has. Um, it's fundamentally changed my world view and given me really unique opportunities and experiences that otherwise I wouldn't have been privy to. I first went to Christmas Island in 2010 as a volunteer, although not with Red Cross. And it was the first time I had come into contact with asylum seekers, people who had gone through a very different migration experience to me and my parents when we came to Australia in the late 80s as economic migrants. Um, it was also the first time I'd been in an immigration detention centre and, as you can imagine, I found it quite an overwhelming experience. Um, simply put, my five short weeks in the immigration detention centres at Christmas Island um, pushed me off my trajectory and I put off um, starting my career in criminal law to volunteer um, with different organisations in the asylum seeker refugee field. Um, once I did start practising law, I didn't stop volunteering in this field, however. Um, I think when it comes to volunteering, and I'm sure there are quite a few volunteers in the audience here today, we might not get paid for what we do, but I don't think it's a particularly well-kept secret that we do get a lot out of volunteering work. Um, I can't speak on behalf of anyone else, but my strongest motivation, uh, the thing that cements my commitment to volunteering is knowing that the only reason I'm safe and my family is safe is that I'm lucky. Um, it's not that I deserve it. Volunteering enables me to help uh, people who haven't been as fortunate as me and to safeguard their rights, something which I find deeply satisfying. Before becoming involved with Red Cross, um, I volunteered, well I didn't volunteer, but I voluntarily um, went to one of the detention centres for a year on a weekly basis and I watched um, how people's mental health deteriorated over that, that period of the one year. I was humbled by the strength exhibited by the people I met. Many of them confided in me, telling me uh, that they'd been subjected to torture in their home country and had undergone perilous journeys to come to Australia. Some of them had been uh, imprisoned in countries along the way. Some of them had been on boats that had sunk and they watched people drown in front of them. <clears throat> their resilience was truly incredible, but this didn't lessen their vulnerability and their time in immigration detention took its toll. It became very clear to me that the conditions of detention could either exacerbate or improve poor mental health. The reality is that people who are in detention have limited influence on their everyday surroundings. And as already touched on today, um, I'm not diminishing the role of self-advocacy in this area. Um, in, 
promoting detainees' rights, but an organisation like Red Cross has an essential and recognised role to play in this sphere, especially when it comes to systemic or thematic issues which affect many people in many of the centres. I applied for the position as, the humanitarian, as a volunteer humanitarian observer because I was drawn to Red Cross's approach to asylum seeker rights in immigration detention. The organisation occupies a unique position in this field. Its stance of neutrality on confidentiality allows the organisation to step away from the discourse on policy and avoid the politics. One aspect of Red Cross's underpinning philosophy particularly resonated with me, that people in detention should be treated with dignity and respect. Red Cross is the only organisation which visits all of the immigration detention centres and now offshore processing centres on a regular basis, which enables it to identify issues of concern not only in individual centres, but systemic thematic issues across the network and advocate at a national as well as a site level. Although many of these centres are now closed, the remote location of many of those immigration detention centres makes it difficult and expensive for individuals and organisations to visit the centres and that places much of the responsibility of monitoring the conditions with the Red Cross. Red Cross's neutrality and independence firmly places its mandate beyond questions around policy, focusing instead on the treatment of people in immigration detention, the health, well-being and immigration of those asylum seekers. In a rapidly changing environment and policy context, the Red Cross evidence-based approach is informed by immutable standards. Their neutrality, which makes it a trusted and reputable organisation, in conjunction with the confidential nature of its advocacy, assists Red Cross in its discussions with both detainees and the government when it makes its recommendations. It gives it a unique role in promoting the rights of asylum seekers in detention. Its seemingly quiet ad advocacy can be very powerful and I want an opportunity to contribute to its work. I've been asked to talk a bit about my experience as a volunteer on Nauru and Christmas Island and obviously because of the confidential nature of the work, can't really talk about the conditions there. So I think I'll just speak more generally about the challenges of working in immigration detention and the aspects that I found particularly satisfying. My interaction with the detainees was both the most rewarding and the most dis difficult aspect of the role. In my role, I learned how to adapt my approach to take into account people's backgrounds, so they felt comfortable talking to me about the conditions of detention. Volunteering as a humanitarian observer taught me how to connect with traumatised and vulnerable people from very, very different cultural backgrounds to my own. Even when that connection is brief, that moment of trust and mutual Mutual respect is incredibly special. This is especially the case where detainees have developed an overt, an overt distrust of visiting organisations or individuals. People who have been in detention for a long period of time, who have aired their grievances with Red Cross and other organisations repeatedly, voice their frustration at their continued detention and the fact that some of their concerns had not yet been addressed. At times, these detainees did not want to engage with Red Cross again. Sometimes this reticence could not be overcome, but sometimes it was a case of putting away my notepad and pen and asking people questions in a more casual conversation and after a while, detainees would start revealing what the issues in detention were. Some of my most satisfying moments have been turning initially antagonistic interactions into fruitful conversations. After all, an important part of the monitoring work is engaging with a representative group of the population in the detention or processing centre. On the other end of the spectrum is managing the expectations of detainees who are not as well versed with the mandate of Red Cross. People who speak to Red Cross in the hope that the organisation will be advocate, would be able to advocate on their behalf across a broad range of topics. Some people are worried about the safety of their families back home or they wanted to know whether they were going to get refugee status or visas. Sometimes they challenge aspects of the policies of the Australian government. Redirecting the conversation while acknowledging that the issue being raised was of high priority to the detainee was a delicate balancing act. If done well, then the detainee would engage with me on the topics with which Red Cross could assist, the conditions in the centre. Of course, there's always the risk of alienating someone if the situation is not well managed. When considering the efficacy of Red Cross's work, and more specifically when assessing the success of a visit, 
there are a few aspects that need to be reviewed. One measurement is whether the team has spoken to a group representative of the population in the center. In terms of the percentage of the whole of the population, but also in terms of whether we have spoken to people from all of the language groups. As you can imagine, this can create competing priorities at times. Where a particular language group is a small minority in the center and thus potentially more vulnerable than a group that represents the majority. Triangulation of information that has been collected by the team requires that the team continually shares with each other what they have learnt and identify what further evidence is required. Time management during a visit is as much about being flexible in a changeable environment and responsive to emerging issues as it is about planning well. This approach helps to ensure the integrity of the information gathered and enables the team to make meaningful recommendations after analysing this information. Whether the team has successfully triangulated information provided by detainees determines what is raised with stakeholders in line with Red Cross's evidence-based approach. I can imagine a lot of people wonder whether Red Cross's advocacy is effective. Without going into specifics, I can say that there were times when we raised issues of which the stakeholders, whether that's the government or service providers, had not been aware, but those issues did concern them. I can also say that I've been on a trip where one particular concern was raised in the middle of the trip, rather than waiting for the exit meetings with the stakeholders, and the issue was resolved within a few hours. On the other hand, there are times when Red Cross raises the same issue repeatedly, and it remains unaddressed. It is especially in these situations that it's important to perse persevere. I don't think it's possible to discuss my experience as a volunteer without touching on my experience as a member of the Red Cross team. I've been fortunate to work with four Red Cross humanitarian observers, all of whom have slightly different approaches to their work in the centres and in their discussions with various stakeholders. The Red Cross employees struck the perfect balance of giving me enough support so that I didn't feel out of my depth and giving me enough free reign to develop my own style of working and to be confident that I was making a valuable contribution to the team. Which I suppose brings me to the final point that I'll be discussing today, and that's the role of volunteers in monitoring the conditions of immigration detention. This has already been touched on briefly by Vicky earlier on, but given that the conditions of detention and monitoring those conditions entails looking at a broad um, range of concerns such as adequate medical treatment, psychological support and legal advice, it's ideal to have a team comprised of people who have different skills and knowledge. I've worked with one humanitarian observer whose qualifications are in the field of psychology and her knowledge allowed her to identify factors contributing to poor mental health of detainees as well as identifying procedures or service pr provision which were not in line with best practice. Her background also provided her with the skills to assist and support the rest of the team in situations where self-harm or suicidal ideation were disclosed to the Red Cross observers. Another volunteer humanitarian observer had expertise in sphere standards and could adapt those standards to the immigration detention context and provide guidance on measuring and assessing detention, the detention centre environment. I personally come from a legal background, having volunteered as a migration agent and practised criminal law. Although I can't provide legal advice in my capacity as a volunteer humanitarian observer, I can identify legal issues and highlight with the team concerns that might otherwise have been overlooked. As most of you here today would be aware, there are individuals in detentions, who, detention centres or processing centres who have had or currently have criminal matters before the court and I could clarify queries within the team about criminal procedure, for example. I found that a team made up of observers with different professional backgrounds, knowledge, skills and experience improves the team's ability to correctly identify and analyse issues and then make the most appropriate recommendations. The Red Cross team might not have the capacity to give the medical or legal advice, but having that knowledge within the team provides the frameworks around best practice and standards. Um, and I suppose I would just want to end by thanking Red Cross for giving me the opportunity to be involved in your very valuable work. Thanks, Andrew. I don't know about you, but I'm both informed and inspired, I think, by those presentations. Um, a fabulous selection of speakers. Um, Vicky and your team for, for putting together the, the uh, workshop. I'd like to thank you for 
for the spread from the, the highest level international policy all the way down to the grassroots perspective, which I think has given us a very broad range of understanding of, of the program and the challenges, but also the achievements. So uh, well done to all the speakers. And uh, if you could join me again in thanking all the speakers for their contributions today. We have a little, a little bit less than 15 minutes before the end of our session, and so um, I don't know whether it was a very comprehensive uh, set of uh, presentations, but there may well be some questions from the audience. Do we have anybody who'd like to ask a question? Hello. Um, so my question is, what role does the Red Cross have to play in, if any, in ensuring you know our uh, the recommendations or the implementation of our recommendations are followed through? You know, excuse the language, how do we keep the bastards honest? That was strategic. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that our repeat visits are essential. So sometimes, I mean, especially in the current environment, it might be very challenging to get some of the really big picture policy changes happening in the speed that we'd like, but the repeated visits by our team at a site level, constantly pushing on the recommendations that were made last time and the recommendations from that visit is essential. So we've got ways of both tracking how those issues are treated, but also escalating them up. So, um, for example, if my team are not getting any traction on those issues, then we present it to, to Noel and to senior management to advocate at a much higher level. Um, and that's when we'll start to look at being a bit more strategic about how we might advocate on some of those issues through research, through increased pressure. So. I think certainly, especially at a site level, those repeat visits are so essential to making sure that we are putting our concerns on the record, but also to making sure that those concerns are acted on. So, yeah. Do you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, both, both Fred and uh, Vicky referred to uh, private talks with the authorities. When you say the authorities, are you talking about uh, the government or are you talking about the contractor? And the second question, I think, Vicky, you referred to the reserving of the right to go public. What exactly did you mean by that? <laughs> Thanks very much for your question. I'm not sure why. I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised they came up. Um, when we talk about private talk, certainly from Australian Red Cross perspective, we're actually referring to a range of people, but our official discussions are with the authorities. So in the case at a uh, site level, that's the Department of Immigration. So in the past, we've also engaged specifically in exit meetings with some of the contractors, but we've certainly made the decision now that the responsibility lies with the Department of Immigration. So that's who we have those, as we call them, exit meetings. ICRC will refer to them as final talks. Um, we also engage with the authorities at a national level and at a range of different levels at a national level as well. So when we talk about the public authorities, generally we're talking about the relevant department. Um, but we will have a lot of both informal and formal discussions with the contractors, with the service providers in immigration detention as well. And often they are very, um, they're very keen to speak to us about some of the concerns that they might have um, in the meetings that we have with them. In terms of reserving the right to go public, um, I won't call Noel up. I'll, I'll take that one and he can tell me off later on. Um, so we actually have a provision, and this is specific, I should say, um, to the Australian Red Cross. We have a provision in our memorandum of understanding that if the escalation of issues um, doesn't result in the kind of change that we're seeking, then we can always reserve the right to go public. But I should say that decisions like that have to be balanced to get thing against things like access to immigration detention facilities. They also have to be discussed in the context of what we might achieve if we were to speak publicly. So a good example at the moment, and it's a question that we'll probably get if we haven't had already, um, about why we're not speaking publicly at the moment is that we constantly evaluate whether or not that is going to have an impact, whether or not we've done everything we can behind the scenes to make sure that the issues that are raised with us in immigration detention 
are resolved. So we do everything we can to try and resolve those at a site level and at a national level. And I should point out that another element of our confidentiality is the confidentiality we promise to detainees within immigration detention. And that's really important, that when we talk to people and when they tell us their concerns, we ask them for permission to raise those concerns. And we don't always get permission to raise them. So that's an important factor, I think, um, around speaking publicly as well. Well, just uh, maybe very briefly about uh, the private talks. So private talks for us, we also call them interview without witness. So this is with the detainees. Uh, and it means, as I explained before, that we can talk about the conditions of detention with the detainees without anyone else than the Red Cross listening to it. And for, for us, this is a, is a, a fundamental uh, basis to, 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 to identify problems in the place of detention and, ident and identify individual problems of, uh, of uh, detainees. And this is the basis then for our confidential dialogue with the, with the authorities. So uh, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, that gives us the material to, to, uh, for the discussion to improve the conditions of detention. Uh, and the comment I would make is that um, there are other organisations that have some access to the detention centres and the processing centres who do go into a lot of public advocacy, um, who speak out, write reports, publish reports, go into the media. And so it's not as if the issues, or certainly some of the issues that are raised in our confidential reports and discussions with the government don't get into the public domain. They do get into the public domain um, through other channels. And so I think we, it's not that we leave the public advocacy to others, but we are satisfied to a certain degree that public advocacy is being done by those who believe that that's the um, best way to do it. Would that be a fair comment? No? <laughs> no comment, okay. Any more questions? <laughs> yes, up the back, oh, after you. Uh, thank you very much. I I'm just interested in, um, first of all, whether you speak to everyone in a particular facility, and, and, and secondly, as, as kind of a follow-up to that, how do you ensure that um, perhaps people that are um, quieter, perhaps the, the most marginalised, most vulnerable people um, actually get heard, and it's not just the, um, the most kind of um, active uh, voices that are heard in, in terms of um, the commentary on, on the facility? <laughs> Lucky me. Um, so one of the ways our program frames it is that we always try and make sure that we're accessing the most vulnerable and not the most vocal. Um, a lot of that is about relationship building. A lot of that is about the same people going back time and time again and building trust. A lot of that also has to do with the emblem, as John referred to um, in the opening. A lot of people we speak to in immigration detention recognise the Red Cross and they trust the Red Cross. Um, that overcomes a lot of barriers that may be there in the first place. But just to give you a very concrete idea of how we may do that, that sometimes we may go into an immigration detention facility where people aren't so keen to engage or whether, where we know that there are particularly vulnerable people that may not want to be directly approached by us. In that case, we will sit down in that immigration detention centre and we will sit there for as long as it takes until people are comfortable in coming and talking to us. Um, and really just creating a space where people feel comfortable to talk to us. We'll also often roam a detention facility, so we don't have anyone accompanying us. We have um, an obligation to be kind of line of sight with other staff within the facility, but for um, our monitoring and tracing teams, we are able to roam through those facilities and identify people who may be sitting by themselves somewhere and, and see if they're interested in approaching us. We also may talk to community leaders within the centre to ask them whether or not there's anyone they know who, who might want to talk to Red Cross. There's a range of ways we really seek to access the most vulnerable in detention. We would never say that on a visit we would speak to everyone, um, especially over the last couple of years where we've had so many people in detention that actually our way of working changed a little from individual discussions to managing very large groups in detention. Um, but it's certainly becoming um, more important now to make sure that we create that space for people who may not run forward and speak to us immediately to be able to come to us when they're comfortable. And I should say, I mean, a lot of people think that the observing work kind of finishes um, once a trip's finished, but our staff 
constantly receive emails and phone calls from people in detention. So both the monitoring and tracing teams have posters up in all immigration detention facilities so that people can call us if they want to speak to us when we're not on a visit as well, which um, often is something that people after they've thought about may want to contact us between visits. So we've got a very strong focus at the moment on that practice of how we access the most vulnerable and being responsible with that access is a, a focus for us as well. Does the MOU with the Australian government cover access to Manus and to Nauru? No, that's specifically around Australian facilities, but um, as a team we would work in the spirit of that, that MOU when we're working offshore. Yeah. Um, Vicky, is there any likelihood that uh, the Australian government would say uh, our Australian Red Cross has been through this facility, so and th that's uh, they've said it's okay. So what we're doing is okay. Do they do they have any obligations to not use our name to validate what they're doing? Well, I think uh, that has to do with uh, the confidentiality of uh, of our reports. That's uh, one. Uh, of the conditions that uh, no no elements of any report are being used uh, publicly without the consent without our consent because well I mean there are um, plenty of different uh, issues are addressed in a report uh, there can be some uh, positive remarks I mean uh, from one visit to the other there are certain recommendations have been followed so that's a positive development so that what is what we would mention in the in a subsequent report. Now, obviously, there are other elements in the report where um, uh, certain issues uh, have deteriorated, where uh, no, no action has been taken from those responsible, the responsible authorities. And obviously, you cannot just uh, take out um, the elements of a report which pleases you, which pleases the authorities. So this is uh, something which we make uh, always clear in all our reports that they cannot be published without our consent. And I think for you this is probably and the I'd, same. I'd add to that that um, what we work towards is a really strong working relationship, especially with the department, to make sure that they listen to our recommendations and that we engage um, very honestly with them about what we see and what recommendations we might suggest. So. Um, within the current environment, we can still have very strong relationships to encourage that, that discussion. Um, but instrumentalisation, as, as it would be referred to, is always a, a potential, I guess, in that, um, where any particular side may seek to utilise Red Cross's name in that, uh, that, um, that debate. I'm just wondering, um, how do you communicate with uh, non-English speaking backgrounds? Do you take interpreters and what percentage of the people that you visit um, actually speak English? And excuse my ignorance on that one, but I'm just curious. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it really varies. It would be hard for me to give an exact percentage on what percentage of the population can speak um, English in a way that can convey the, the very essence of their concerns in detention, which is sometimes quite complex. Um, when we go into detention, we have access to use interpreters who are on site, um, who are already working with the department there, but they have a provision where they can come and work with us and maintain Red Cross confidentiality um, in our engagements with people in detention. So we do use those interpreters. In the case where an interpreter may not be available, then we use a phone interpreter. We also have some staff and volunteers that have language skills that enable them to actually engage with particular populations in, in their language. Um, but we're always very careful that, especially when we get into quite complex areas of concern, to make sure that even if someone does speak English, to make sure that they're confident enough in expressing the essence of those concerns, which is why we will call interpreters in even if someone's speaking English. Yeah. I was going to say that, that was our last question. Um, it is three o'clock and I'm, I'm sensitive to timing because uh, the president and the CEO are pretty 
want to run this pretty tight. What I do think, though, is that if you do have a couple of questions, I'm sure our panel will hang around for a couple of minutes afterwards and perhaps you can ask them privately if you, if you have a burning desire to do so. But in the interest of uh, efficiency, I would like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for taking the time to join us at this workshop on what we think is a very important aspect of the Australian Red Cross work and the international movement's work, something that interests me, of course, and obviously interests you. And thanks again to all of our panel members. for <laughs> <please>. <laughs>